So tonight's presentation is going to be on the Carolina Jubilee. We're going to go over as much information as I can cover, but this is a presentation that I would really encourage you to go back and look at it and pause and read some of the newspaper articles that I'm going to show. There's just no possible way to go in extreme detail on each article and to really spend time on every picture. It's going to be, I'm, I'm going to try to keep it as short as I can. So we'll go ahead and jump into it. So the first Carolina Jubilee was in 1935. It was April 25th to the 28th and it coincided with the Dogwood Festival. There were 1,000 to 1,500 scouts expected in attendance. We don't know the exact number of scouts that attended. However, I believe it was less than 1,000. Now, the early history of scouting in Chapel Hill and at the University of Chapel Hill is a little murky, and I'm not sure we have a good understanding of what happened there. But in 1925, I found an article where it talks about basically having a patrol leader camp at the university and then in 33, it talks about a scoutorama at Fetzer Field, was at, which is at the university. So it's possible that these early collaborations between the University of Chapel Hill and Boy Scouts were what laid the groundwork for having the 1935, 38, and 41 Jubilees. So in this article on the left, it says, Mr. Steer will go to Chapel Hill March 14th to spend three days attending the annual seminar for Boy Scout executives in North Carolina. Plans will be made at that time for the Boy Scout Jamboree to be held in Chapel Hill in April. So it, it does say annual seminar for Boy Scout executives, which may give a little bit of a clue to a long-lasting relationship between scouting and the university at this time. And then you can just see that they're still in the planning phase, February and March, for the first Jubilee. So in the article on the left, it talks about more than a 1,000 scouting Scouts representing communities in every section of North Carolina will gather at the University of Carolina April 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th to hold a jubilee in celebration of the 25th anniversary of scouting. I think that most likely the reason they put such a special emphasis on this jubilee and, and they really tried to kind of elevate it to the next level as a regional event was because it, it was the 25th anniversary of scouting. Now it says here, the Charlotte group of scouts will be trained for the camporee early in the spring in weekend training camps to be conducted at Camp Steer. There is a possibility that some of the Charlotte scouts will enter the nation scouting jamboree in Washington August 21st through the 30th. So this is talking about the 1935 Jubilee, and it's important to remember that at this time, leading into the Carolina Jubilee, that they still thought they were going to have the 1935 National Jamboree. We know it was later canceled, and the first National Scouting Jamboree was held in 1937. But they just weren't aware of, of what was going to happen later in the year of that period. And you can kind of see how big of a deal it was to them going to the Jubilee is that they're actually having training camps leading up to it. Now, what is on the left there is a program from the 1935 Jubilee, which is just absolutely wonderful to have. It is the only paper item I have personally seen put out with information from the Jubilee. And then on the right, you see a photo from a scrapbook, and it says, All of Us. So th this was during the Jubilee in 1935. And on stage, you had James E. West and, and all the other big guests of the Jubilee. This is where I'm getting my attendance estimate. You can assume that a vast majority of the people in the stadium are scouts. There are probably some people from the university, and there are probably some members of the public who were there just to observe. But that, to me, does not look like 1,500 people, but maybe it is. It, it's very hard to guesstimate just based off this one photo we have. Now, I really like this on the left. It's put out by the Daily Tar Heel, which was the university's publication. And it says, it would be a major calamity if the Dogwooders came upon Boy Scouts chopping down dogwood for firewood next weekend, referencing them being at the Dogwood Festival. And then on the right, you have a milk advertisement, which I thought was pretty cool, where it references the Jubilee, and it was put out during the time period of the Jubilee. Now, these are some of the honored guests 
and staff members that were at the Jubilee. The pamphlet's a little hard to read, but a couple of the notice, notable people that are mentioned in it is, of course, James E. West, Chief Scout Executive, Kenneth Bentz, the Region 6 Executive, and William C. Wessel from New York City, who was the National Director of Cubbing. Now, some of their photos and some of the additional information can be seen better in the newspaper article on the right. They treated this as a very big deal. You had representatives from Region 6, and they were essentially putting on the event with cooperation from the North Carolina councils. Now, we have, from all these articles, we can kind of draw some information as far as what the actual schedule was for the event. So you can see, I've recreated the schedule. Scouts arrive on Thursday afternoon. The big noticeable thing was that they had a campfire program Friday night. But during the day, they had individual scout skills on Friday, scout games, patrol scout skills, demonstration events, and then tours of the campus. And it is noted in here that Alpha Phi Omega was helping put on the Jubilee in 1935. So here are some additional photos from the Jubilee. On the left, you have an inspection. And then on the right, it shows a photo of some of the scouts. Now, these photos came in 1938 newspapers. However, they were taken at the 35 Jubilee and used as promotional material for the 38. I personally have never seen any other photos from this series. I'm guessing it is a series. Um, but these are the only two I've ever seen. They were used by multiple newspapers, but one's labeled 20 and one's labeled 22. Um, the top one is scouts gathered in preparation for a meal. All their meals were at Swain Hall. And then the bottom, it shows a portion of the camp at the women's athletic field. Now here's some more photos from the scrapbook. So you can kind of see a demonstration campsite on the left. And then on the right, they have the lowering of the flag. Now, another big part of the Jubilee was that they had an Indian ball game. My understanding is that the Indian ball game was essentially what lacrosse is based off of. So I'll read you a little bit of the caption from the picture on the left from the newspaper. The participants are Cherokee Indians who are making the trip to Chapel Hill from their 63,000 acre reservation adjoining the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in the western part of the state. Those who have seen the game say it makes modern baseball players look like sissies. Ten fights going on at one time and no holds or punches barred is the way one writer described the game recently in an article in the Atlanta Constitution. So essentially a very <laughs> rough game of lacrosse is what I've been told it is. Um, the interesting thing is that this would be the first sporting event at a Carolina Jubilee, but both the 38 and 41 would have sporting events during the Jubilee. So the big part of the Jubilee in 1935, that was kind of the keystone part of the event, was the scout pageant. So I'll just briefly go over some of the interesting parts from the pageant. It started with a grand entry march by the university band and a rededication to the scout oath led by Dr. James E. West. And then in the kind of the main part of the pageant, it was called a pageant of scouting and was directed by William C. Wessel, the camp chief. And in that advancement portion, they had a roundup of new tenderfoot scouts. So they had new tenderfoot scouts attending and they were recognized. And then you had the award of the Eagle Badges by James E. West at the Jubilee. On the upper left, you can see Chief West approaches. He's going up to make a speech. And then you can actually see him speaking to the crowd there from their perspective on the lower right. And here's another photo of him. And this was right after he awarded the 22 Eagle Scouts their Eagle Award. Now, something really interesting that I never heard of before in relation to the Jubilee is this little part of the article where it says, Chief Scout of the World, Lord Baden-Powell of England, presented to Dr. West the Golden Era Award of Brotherhood and International Goodwill. So I'm guessing there was someone there who acted kind of as a proxy for Baden-Powell and presented him this Golden Era of Brotherhood 
and international goodwill. So I, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Now, there's really no memorabilia from the 35 Jubilee. There's the pamphlet, and then there's these cachet covers. So you have it says on there, Dogwood Festival, Boy Scout Jubilee, and it goes through um, the dates and everything, Region 6. I am guessing, just based on these came out in 35, there were no covers in 38 or 41, I'm guessing that somebody that made these, made these, that they, they were kind of associated with the Dogwood Festival. And maybe they saw an opportunity to make these and sell these during the Jubilee. Um, maybe they were making other philatelic items for the Dogwood Festival. So, but I don't know that these were actually made by anyone from the Jubilee. Still, it's the only real collectible item you can get from the event. So let's move to the 1938 Caroline Jubilee, which was October 6th and 9th, 1938. It was 1,500 to 2,000 scouts expected in attendance. I am guessing that they had closer to 1,400 people there. And we'll kind of go over why these discrepancy in numbers. So on the left, you see it says between 1,500 to 2,000 Boy Scouts from this and the neighboring states will assemble. The Jubilee, which is sponsored by the university in Region 6. So this is once again confirming that the Jubilee event, while it was held here in North Carolina, it was a Region 6 event, ex with, which extended North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And then the paper on the right, talking about a total of 1,409 scouts from North and South Carolina attended this Jubilee. As a very specific number, you really don't get very specific numbers in these newspaper, old newspaper articles. Usually they're kind of rounded. So I don't know if that's right, that they you know, got that number from someone and put it in the paper. Um, I, I do think it is more accurate than 1,500 to 2,000. So here's some information that I found from councils outside of North Carolina coming to the Jubilee. The Augusta Area Council was allowed to send six patrols, and the campery was held to determine those eligible to attend the Jubilee. And then it says from the Blue Ridge Council, of, and then it mentions a quota, um, and that first-class scouts who have one week in a scout camp are eligible. What I want you to take from this is that, in some way, when they were planning the Jubilee, they restricted attendance from all these councils and said, look, you can send this number of people. And I'm not sure if some of these requirements were council. The councils could decide the requirements to fill their quota or if there were some overall requirements from the people holding the Jubilee. It's a little unclear, but essentially you had to earn for most councils, you had to earn the ability to go to the Jubilee, and it was, and they were restricted in the number of scouts they could send. And the article on the left talks about all the blue ribbon winners at the campery held this year in Wilson will be eligible to attend. And then on the right, it says the East Carolina Council representation is limited to 27 patrols. So this is 27 patrols, and this is in August, you know, before the Jubilee. Now... October 1st, 1938, it says the East Carolina, 32 patrols. So the number of patrols has increased. So what I believe has happened is the quotas somehow, some of the councils were not able to fill all their spots. It could be as simple as they gave spots to councils in Florida, and the scouts from Florida did, weren't able to travel all the way to the Jubilee and back. It wasn't as feasible at the time in 1938. There could be other things going on. Some, you know, maybe the requirements were too stringent and they just didn't have enough scouts that fit within their requirements. But then I think what happened is as they got closer to the event, they realized they were going to be under their attendance goal. And so to try to, you know, allow more people to come, they, incre you know, if a council could send more boys, they were allowing those councils to send more boys. However, you saw that they were having camperies and all these events to kind of determine who they would send to the Jubilee. It was kind of an earned thing. So I'm sure it was hard to coordinate if you're suddenly being told, well, yeah, you can send 10% more scouts, 20% more scouts, how many ever. It was probably hard to coordinate 
to get people to be able to go as they got closer to the event. And that's why I think they missed their attendance goal in 1938. Um, it's, it's cool that it says all Jubilee Scouts must be at school Thursday morning on time and check in. Permission to attend the Jubilee is recognized by schools all over the state as an educational project. So on the upper left, it says only one troop was above the age limit of 15. And it's referring to the SSS Davy Jones, so Sea Scout Ship Davy Jones. This is the only mention in any article about an age limit. It, it could be right. I, I don't know. But certainly if there was an age limit of 15, it would have drastically reduced the number of scouts that would have been eligible to attend the Jubilee. And then you've got on the right, the top left, you've got Paul Snack, the chairman of Region 6. Top right, you have Herbert Stuckey. And he was a deputy executive of Region 6. And then the lower right, you have James E. West. So James E. West would attend the 35 and the 38 Jubilee. However, he would not come back in 1941. So then you have some more scheduling information that can be found in the newspapers. I included those articles there on the left. And then you have on the upper right, it talks about how parents especially are expected Friday night to see the Scoutorama as this event is free to the public and all 1600 scouts will be in this project. And then you have a photo of some of the boys lining up to do registration when they were attending the Jubilee. Now most of those boys do look fairly young which may lead a little bit of uh, credence to there being a 15 year age limit. Um, some of the Young adults and men we see standing there with them could very well be their scout masters or assistant scout masters. So I've recreated the schedule again. The key part to take away from this is that they had this big scout arama at 8:30 on Friday, and it was open to the public. It was a really big deal, and you can see they rehearsed it over and over throughout the jubilee, leading up to the scout arama, which is kind of interesting. It was it, that was a very big production to put on for the public. And then later during the Jubilee on Saturday, they had some of this inspection and some other things, but they had the Carolina Tulane football game. And at halftime, there was a Boy Scout demonstration during the game. Once again, on the right, you'll notice there's a milk advertisement in the papers. Very interesting that every Jubilee had a milk advertisement in the paper. Now, this is a picture. I know the quality isn't great, but it's Raleigh Scouts undergoing an inspection at the 1938 Jubilee. And then, unfortunately for uh, UNC Chapel Hill, during the du Jubilee, when they had all these people there to watch the game, they lost. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so tar, the Tar Heels lose 17-14. So there's this brief mention of Alpha Phi Omega again in 1938. It seems that they were active both in 35 and in 38, helping put on the Jubilee. However, there's really no mention of them in 1941, so I don't know if something happened to the fraternity in the meantime or something like that. Um, really cool. Two brothers on the right. The older brother was at the first National Jamboree and had his eagle given to him by James E. West at the Jamboree. The younger brother was at the 38 Jubilee, and he had his eagle given to him at the 38 Jubilee by James E. West. Now, the memorabilia item from the Jubilee is this felt patch. It says Caroline Jubilee on it. All the ones I've ever seen were sewn, placed on the shirt above the pocket, like the uniform picture to the left. It is slightly mentioned in this article from 38 where it says, All patrols qualified for the Camperol emblem. That could just be their choice of phrase in the article, or it could mean that there were requirements for the boys going to the Jubilee. The patch is very scarce. I believe there's maybe half a dozen of them known in collections that I've seen. So, yeah, maybe double that number, and that's how many are out there floating around. Um, so I, I find it hard to imagine that all you know, 1,400, maybe as many as 1,500 boys got this patch, but, you know, may maybe they did make that many. I just find it very unlikely. We found two shirts similar to the one on the left where it says Caroline Jubilee has a 38 Camp Sycamore patch and the tailored sleeves. So the sleeves are actually tailored, which is 
abnormal. Um, oh, I'm sorry, they, they did have different community strips and different troop numbers. Yeah, that, that was different. But, but the placement of everything and the sleeves, all that was the same. What that means, I don't really know. I don't know if they were scouts who were on staff. Camp Sycamore was the camp for the local council that would have been around the Chapel Hill area. So it's possible they pulled in camp staff to staff the Jubilee or to assist. We just don't know. Now, here's a Chapel Hill campery from 1940. Now, this is a little interesting um, just because this is not a Carolina Jubilee, but it just shows that they were still continuing to use Chapel Hill, the university, as well as Chapel Hill, the town that surrounds it, the surrounding area, for scouting events and that like in between the Jubilee years, you know. Um, and you do see the, the cow, the milk truck that drove into camp for them, which I thought was pretty cool. So the last Carolina Jubilee would be held in 1941, September 18th and 21st. It was held on high school day, which meant that there were about 20,000 high school seniors from North Carolina bust in during the same time the Jubilee was going on. They expected 2,500 to 3,000 scouts in attendance. However, I believe the number was most likely closer to 1,600. So just re-looking at these past dates, the first one was held in the spring in April. 38, it was held in October in the fall, and 41, it was held in September. In the article on the left, it says scout officials would cooperate in arranging for the boys to attend the Jubilee. It is felt that the educational value of this trip would be worth the two days of school the scouts would lose. So once again, they were working with the local school systems to allow scouts to attend from North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, as well as Florida. About 2,500 Boy Scouts and Scouters will attend the Jubilee, a visit of 20,000 high school seniors in North Carolina, and the annual football game between Carolina and Lenore Rhine. That article just kind of gives an overview of what they were expecting leading up to the Jubilee. Now, this is really cool. So on the left, it talks about the eight-man patrol of Boy Scouts from the Catawba Indian Reservation from near Rock Hill, South Carolina. And it says that they got to go up there because they won first place for 100% improvised equipment at the council campery. So once again, your spot at the Jubilee was earned. And then it talks about from Tampa, Florida, came six Eagle Scouts. After driving 717 miles in a 39 coach, they arrived in Chapel Hill, able to make the trip by supplements to the small troop treasury from the Tampa P Parent Teacher Association and businessmen. So this is really cool because this is the first actual mention I could find in a paper talking about boys going to the 41 Jubilee from Florida. Well, going to a Carolina Jubilee. It seems that 35 was mostly restricted in North Carolina. And, you know, a couple of professionals out of Georgia where Region 6 was headquartered in Atlanta. And then in South Carolina, you had maybe a little bit of attendance from South Carolina and Georgia. But in 41, you were seeing more widespread attendance from South Carolina and Georgia, as well as a little bit of attendance from Florida. Now, here are some pictures from the 41 Jubilee. On the left, you have Charlotte Scouts. And on the right, you have some Charlotte Scouts as well as the Scouts from the Catawba Indian Reservation in South Carolina. Now, this photo is a really cool photo of Scouts from the Uari Council. And it does mention in this article that there were 1,600 future leaders attending the four-day regional Jubilee, which is 1,600 is a pretty distinctly different number than you know, say 2,500 or so, but it's hard to accurately gauge how many people attended these events just from these newspaper articles. This is talking about Blake Thompson, who was from URA Council, and he was named director of the Jubilee, and he said that the total attendance is limited to 3,000. All councils in North and South Carolina are limited to 20% of their scout membership. So once again, you're seeing that they had to earn the right to go, and that there were limits put in place on the total number of scouts from a particular council able to go to the Jubilee. This is sounding very familiar to why they underperformed in 38 to their attendance goals. And I think that once again, these are some of the reasons why they didn't have the attendance they were expecting in 41. So on the left, you have W.A. Dobson, the regional executive from Atlanta. And then you have Harold Mayer, the UNC professor. He was a professor of sociology and chairman of the local committee. And then on the right, you have Herbert Stuckey, who was at the 38th Jubilee and came back for 41. 
and was still the deputy regional executive from Atlanta. Now I've recreated the schedule once again. There was no big Scouterama thing that they rehearsed during the entire Jubilee. They, they just didn't do that. So it's, it's kind of almost more similar to the 35 schedule in some ways than the 38 schedule. And this is the schedule continuing with Saturday and Sunday. Notice this is interesting. At 10.30 a.m. to 12 p.m., this is the only mention in any of the Jubilees about emblems during the schedule. And it says, break camp, inspection, and awarding of emblems. So that's the only mention in any paper that I found, I believe, of the actual emblems that were awarded. Now, here's just kind of a group photo of boys from the 41 Jubilee. Now, this is a cool photo of Raleigh Scouts at the Carolina Jubilee. Now, the boy on the far left, he's wearing a 1941 camp patch from Camp Croatan, which is just kind of cool. And it makes sense because they would have had summer and then this was in the fall. So they would have had that year's camp patches on their uniforms. So then this just briefly talks about some of the bands. So it says the highlight of the morning events was a parade of 12 high school bands and the Boy Scouts. At halftime, the Boy Scouts gave a mass demonstration. The Drum and Bugle Corps of Troop 4 of Albemarle won the 1941 championship and probably will represent North Carolina and South Carolina at the Florida Jubilee later this year. Now, I've never heard about a Florida Jubilee in the later part of 1941. It is possible that it was canceled. However, I could have just never heard of it. So I would love to learn more about this Florida Jubilee that was planned for the later part of 1941. It sounds like it would have been a Region 6 event like the Carolina Jubilee. And then this is kind of cool. It says uh, swapping of everything from autographs to neckerchiefs. So there was trading going on at the Jubilee. And it also mentions a Universal Newsreel photographer visited the encampment today. And Kate Fear adopted the most dramatic means of communication, two homing pigeons. So they were, <laughs> they communicated back home with homing pigeons. But going back to a Universal Newsreel photographer. So I know that they were giving videos of the Jubilee uh, and they were using them as promotional material at scout meetings and stuff in the later part of the year. So on the right, it says time was given to the moving pictures of activities at Tuscarora Camp and Caroline Jubilee at Chapel Hill. That's for my area, but I found articles from other area referencing these moving pictures from the Jubilee. I reached out to Universal Newsreel. Unfortunately, they had a big fire that burned a lot of their archives of footage. Um, apparently, the material from those film canisters of that time period are very flammable. And they found the card in their catalog that re re referred to the Carolina Jubilee. However, it was in the section that was destroyed by fire. Now, I talked to UNC Chapel Hill in their archive, and they said they did have some footage from the 41 Jubilee. So potentially that's another avenue of research that we can take in the future is trying to reach out to get them, get some copies of some of that footage, as well as maybe they have some additional paperwork. That'd be really cool to look at. Now, there was a special Jubilee edition of 100 copies entitled Boy Scout News. The size page mimeographed issue was printed in red browning. So there was a Jubilee newspaper. It's the only thing we know they issued um, in paper for the event. I mean, I'm sure they had some you know, programs and things, but we don't know them issuing a newspaper for 35 or 38, just for 41. It'd be so cool to find that. Um, on the right, you have the UNC Chapel Hill this is the Jubilee patch from 41. It's a woven and it is supposed to be white. You occasionally see them and they're tan because they get dirty easily. And once they're dirty, they're dirty. Um, but the school colors are white and blue. So they're supposed to be white and blue. They're very hard to find in mint. They're very fragile. Um, I have seen them sewn and washed on uniforms or sashes. And unfortunately, they tend to disintegrate a little bit. Um, they're just, it's, it's a very fragile patch. Now this is cool. So it's talking about the SSS Lumbee. So the Sea Scout ship Lumbee at the Carolina Jubilee. And there was also the crew of the Sea Scout ship Davy Jones. And they staged a shipboard ceremony in Emerson Field. Both ships were national, were part of the national flagship flotilla. Now I'm not a sea scouting expert, but I thought that was kind of neat. Now this is talking about the 
skipper, I think it was, yeah, the skipper from the Sea Scout ship Lumbee, and he was saying that they were having attendance problems with their ship, that they'd lost 12 men to the armed services, eight to the Marines, three to the Navy, one to the Army. And then very interestingly, in the article on the right, it said, among other guests, 150 British sailors and a number of Fort Bragg soldiers were also expected, and this is talking about expected as guests at the university for their football game. So the article on the left says that the central theme of preparedness for service in any emergency. W.A. Dotson, regional executive from Atlanta, stressed, it is particularly vital in times of emergency or possibly war. In the article on the right, it says, with the 1,600 future leaders pledging themselves anew in emergency service calls from their government and praying with all Americans for peace among all men. And so these articles are September 20th. You know, remember the Jubilee was in September and then December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor, United States is at war. So the theme from the Jubilee, um, they were already kind of feeling some of the stress from the war go already going on since 39 in Europe. Unfortunately, some of the men who were at some of the earlier Jubilees in 35 and 38 probably lost their lives during the war. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, I'll take any questions. For the 35, you had the newspaper article that said that they had 1,409 from the two states. Earlier, you said that there were four states that were invited. So there could have been more from those other two states that you don't have any records of. There could have been. However, the thing is, is that when I looked at, I looked for articles from Georgia and Florida for during that time period referencing the Jubilee, and I found none. Um, most likely... My belief is that, you know, one, it, it was just, it would have been extremely costly to try to travel from Florida to the Jubilee. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that in 35, it was mostly North Carolina, 38, mostly North and South Carolina, maybe a little bit of Georgia, and then turn around and in um, 41 was when you actually saw it really expanding out. And I think that's for a variety of reasons, whether it was transportation issues, cost issues, um, or just, you know, letting people know about it. I mean, I, I don't know that they really promoted it to people outside the state in 35 at all. Um, and really the only people you saw, even in from Georgia in 35, was mainly the uh, people from regional headquarters in Atlanta. Hey, Larry, in 1935, you noted that the camp director was William C. Wessel, who mm -hmm. was also the camp director of the Mohawk Indian Village back in the 20s. Um, and that pageant that they did was probably very similar to the pageant that they had put on at the Eastern States Exposition in all those years. So you can see he, he had a lot of uh, experience doing that, even though he'd moved on at that point to being the national director of Cubbing. It was very cool to see he was also a big wig in the Carolina Jubilee. Oh, yes. And, and, I, and I think that he was absolutely brought in because of his experience. And he's, he was his official position at the Jubilee was camp chief. So he, so he was pretty much in charge of making sure everything was happening that was supposed to be happening. Glad the uh, contingent, he was one of the leaders at the 24 World Jamboree. Well, so he was the leader at the 24 mm -hmm. uh, Jamboree. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Larry, Larry, you probably saw it in those articles from 38, but it mentioned that there was 1,200 at the 35 Jubilee. Yeah, the, the problem you run into, and this is something I've learned in my research, is that somehow, I and I don't know how this happens, um, it's, it's really unfortunate, it's really weird, I, I can't imagine it happening today, but sometimes reporters are wrong. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> I, I have found, absolutely have found where they stated, you know, one thing when an event was happening and later they stated that that event happened in a different year or the amount of people attended it was wrong or all, all these reports, they were by reporters who for the most part had very limited experience with scouting and whoever was reporting in 41 may not have had any experience reporting it in 35 or 38 and that depending on who they talked to and where they got their information from that that that's why I, I 
I like to use newspaper articles as a reference because it's the best reference we have. Um, but it, it's just a lot of this is kind of a gray area as far as, you know, what is actually confirmed knowledge. Eric asked, uh, did your newspaper articles from newspapers.com? They absolutely did. Um, when I do them, I like to, so this is a little tip for any of you guys. Um, of course, I could be doing things totally wrong. But what I like to do is I like to save whatever I'm clipping out. I just save it to my external hard drive and I save it as a PDF if I want to keep just the information. But if I think it is a key piece of information that I'm going to want to include if I ever do a presentation or something, then I also clip it as a JPEG. And my reasoning is that when you're sitting there trying to go back through, it is a whole lot easier to flip through 25, 30 JPEGs than to try to open up that many PDFs and figure them out. And then you have to draw images. And it's a lot easier if I, if I think, oh, that's a good piece of information. That needs to be in a PowerPoint. I pull that out. They asked, uh, what program did I use to lay out my presentation? That was PowerPoint. So I do the same thing that you do there, um, Larry, with uh, newspapers.com. And I save them as PDFs so that I can get the source information about what paper was, what page, and all that good stuff. And then, like like you, if I want to use it, I, I save it also as a JPEG. Yeah. 